Father, we do come before you tonight thanking you that we can meet in your house once again. Father, it's a privilege to be here to study your word tonight. Father, just help us understand your truth. Help us understand the things that we need to know and, and uh, the things that uh, you've shown us in your word, Lord, so that we can be witnesses for you, Lord, so that we can do it with love and with care. And Father, just help us as we go through this study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week we went through the history of the Jehovah's Witness. We saw how they got started. We saw who started them and then kind of the people that did certain things afterwards. So we looked at their history. We looked at a little bit of their information about uh, how many there are, some stats about them right now. And then we started looking at their beliefs. We talked about the Watchtower Society. Watchtower Society is the society or the organization that controls all Jehovah's Witnesses, kind of tells them what to do. We looked at their different beliefs on, on God, on Jesus Christ, on the Holy Spirit, on the Trinity, and then on sin. And that's where we stopped last week. We were looking at their, the last thing we looked at was their beliefs on sin, human depravity. Talked about how really some of their beliefs on that is not a whole lot different than what we believe. And so uh, uh, that, that was where we stopped. So this week we're going to pick up and we're going to jump right in and we're going to start looking at their beliefs on salvation. So what do they believe about salvation? How are you saved? How, how do you have eternal life? How do you uh, get to heaven? Or as we're going to see in a minute, stay on earth forever. Uh, but what, what do you have to do? If you read through their books, if you read through their literature, if you look at things that they have posted online, when you first start reading those things, you'll say, hey, they kind of agree with us. They mention salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. And so they, they talk about that. But then as you continue reading some, what you find out is that's the only the start to salvation. And so as we'll see in a little bit, to us, salvation is grace through faith in Jesus Christ because of who he is and what he's done for us, and that, that's it. It ends there. You know, that's the only thing for salvation is Jesus Christ. But to them, it just gets started there. And so if you look through their literature, you look through what they say, their Watchtower magazine listed four requirements for salvation. Four requirements for salvation. And I think what is interesting about this, based on what I just said, is when you look at their four requirements on salvation, Jesus Christ is not in the mix here. If you look on your sheet of paper there, Jesus Christ is not in this mix, but yet they say that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ and other areas of their literature. And so what we see here is four requirements. Their first requirement is this, you must take in knowledge. And when you first come to them, one of the ways you take in knowledge is you have these, you have five one-hour meetings, um, and, and so you'll, you'll work into this knowledge. Now, one thing to let you know about on this is the knowledge comes from the Watchtower Society. The knowledge comes from the people from the Watchtower Society. So, but you must take in knowledge. Then you, must, you have to obey all of God's commands. That sounds pretty good, but you know, once again, that's work-based salvation. You have to obey all of God's commands. You must be baptized into the organization. This is key. You must be baptized into the organization. Not just baptized, but baptized into the organization. And then finally, you must be active in the organization. And so all of these things show us that it's a works-based salvation. And what do we mean by works-based salvation? That means that salvation is not really through grace by faith. You have to do things to earn salvation. It's a works-based salvation. And what that tells us, because of that, there is no assurance of salvation. And this is a problem that we'll see with a lot of groups, is if salvation is based on works, you're never assured if you're doing good enough to be saved. Right? I mean, that's the way work salvation goes. You never know. And so as you continue to look at their salvation, it's all based on works. But then where they really differ from a lot of folks is they believe there are two classes of people that will have salvation. So there are two different classes of people that will have salvation. They have what they call the anointed class, and then they have the other sheep. And they get both of these, these classes from, what, from parts of their Bible that we're going to look at in a little bit. And so the anointed class, let's, get, let's look at them first. The anointed class. According to them, there is only 144,000 people that will be a part of this class. Now, we just finished studying Revelation. So if you go back to Revelation, 
You'll see in a couple of spots there, Revelation talks about the 144,000 that were sealed. It talks about the 144,000 that were with Jesus Christ on Mount Zion when, uh, after the, uh, right before the thousand years. And so we see these, these, these people, these 144,000. So based on their beliefs, there are only 144,000 people that will be a part of this anointed class. This class will be born again. They will be the ones that will be able to become sons of God. And because of that, because they will be born again, they will become sons of God, they will have a spiritual existence in heaven. So in their beliefs, only 144,000 people from the beginning to the end will actually make it to heaven. Okay? That's all that's going to make it to heaven is 144,000. Everybody else, we'll see what's going to happen. But they will have a spiritual existence in heaven. They are the ones to spiritually guide. These 144,000 people throughout history have been the ones that God has chosen, chosen to spiritually guide God's organization. And they will rule earth from heaven with God is what they believe. Now, some people, Jehovah Witnesses, said that the 144,000 were all sealed and chosen by the year 1935. So in 1935, they said, hey, the 144,000 are chosen. There's no more 144,000 back in 1935. But guess what? The world is still here today. We're getting close to 100 years later. It's hard to believe that we're getting close to 100 years from, <laughs> from 1935. But we're getting, what, about 90, 89, 91 years, something like that. But anyway, we're getting close to that. So the world is still here. Um, the, the Jehovah Witnesses are still around. And guess what? To be a governing body, you have to be sealed to one of the anointed 144,000. So there was a problem there. So in 2007, this is what they, they released as an article in their Watchtower magazine. And remember, their Watchtower magazine is as good as the Bible, okay? Is as good as the Bible, Watchtower Magazine. It says, without a doubt, if one of the anointed unrepentantly falls away, Jehovah does call another individual to take his place. However, the number of genuine anointed ones who have become unfaithful is likely not large. On the other hand, as time has gone by, some Christians baptized after 1935 have had witness born to them that they have the heavenly hope. Thus it appears that we cannot set a specific date for, for when the calling of Christians to the heavenly hope ends. So in other words, what they were saying is that there can still be part of this 144,000 because people may fall away or we don't know who's really part of it. If you continue reading this article, it talks about how that's between Jehovah and the person that says they're anointed, so they're just going to, to, to go with it. But bottom line is this. They only believe there's going to be 144,000 of them in heaven. And then you have the other sheep, as they call it. The other sheep. This is an unnumbered crowd of faithful persons, but they will not go to heaven. They will be saved. They will have salvation because of their works and what they've done, but they will not go to heaven. They have been promised everlasting life here on earth in a paradise-like world. So, remember when we were studying the book of Revelation, we talked about the thousand-year reign and how in the thousand-year reign, it's going to be, you know, basically paradise situation then because there's still be sin here because man's going to be born. But what they're saying is that when, when you become one of these other sheep and you find salvation, that you will be on earth and you'll live in this paradise condition. But you got to work hard for it because... During the thousand year reign that Jesus is going to be here on earth, they believe in that. And they believe that if you mess up during that thousand year reign, that you could lose your salvation. You could lose your salvation tonight because you did something wrong. You could lose, you could lose your salvation and therefore you wouldn't inherit the earth or be one of the, the other sheep. And the only way to be on this earth for everlasting life is if you prove your faithfulness by faith in Jehovah's baptism, provided that you abide in his organization and you keep your conscience clean through faith and loyal service. Sounds like a lot to do to keep your salvation, doesn't it? And so that's the other sheep. They have no assurances. Salvation is earned through a combination of faith plus good works. 
They must work toward perfection in this life and through the end times, through the 1,000 year reign, and then through Satan's last effort. If they pass, then they may be granted eternal life by God, but if they fail at any point, they're at risk of complete annihilation. And here's the other thing about this class. They will never see Jesus Christ or Jehovah, in their words, Father, God, in person. They will always be on earth and never see Jehovah or Jesus Christ in person because they will be here on earth and the 144,000 will be reigning them from heaven. And so that is their basis or that is their beliefs on salvation. We'll see later how much different that is from our beliefs on salvation, but it is a very different belief on salvation than what we have. And then the last belief we're going to look at is their beliefs on the afterlife because it is so different. Their belief on the afterlife. The first thing I want you to understand about them and about us, and I know you guys have heard me say this before, that I believe the Bible teaches us that our body, or that, that we are made up of, of two separate parts. We have a physical body and we have a soul. Yeah, I'm sure y'all have heard me talk about that because what happens when we die is our physical body goes in the ground, our soul will go to, to heaven until Jesus Christ returns, and if we are dead, it says our body is raised, and we will meet God in heaven, and our body will be glorified, and our soul will come together, and we'll, we'll be one with, with our body and our soul once again. Well, they don't believe that. They do not believe that the human soul or spirit is distinct from our physical body. So when Adam was created by God and God breathed life into him, I believe that is when God breathed the living soul into man, is my belief, when God breathed life into him. They don't believe that. They believe that, when, that Adam was not given a soul, but when God breathed life into him, that Adam became a living soul and that our bodies, our physical bodies and our souls are one together. There's no different. And if a person dies, the soul dies, is what they believe. So if a person is dead, a, purchase, a person is unconscious, they're inactive because the soul itself is dead. hope that makes sense on you. It's kind of hard to, to understand, but that's what they believe. And so they believe that the afterlife, there's only two options for the afterlife. You're either alive forever as a spirit in heaven or on earth, or you're just nothing. You're just nothing. If you have never been saved then your body dies, your soul dies, and you just go out of existence. You're, you're unconscious. They do not believe that there is hell at all. The doctrine of hell where the wicked are tortured eternally is not true. They believe that is a made-up doctrine, is not in the Bible, and is not true. They believe that the word death or the word hell literally means the grave in the Bible. So every time Jesus Christ in the Bible talks about hell, all he's talking about is the grave. Now, we'll look at some verses later that talk about hell, and, and we'll see why I don't believe in that. But they believe that if you are one of those that are saved, 144,000 or the other sheep, then you'll go to heaven, or you'll stay on earth in paradise conditions. But if you do not die, there's no punishment for you. If you die and you don't believe, then you just cease to exist. No punishment at all. You just cease to exist. Nothingness is what it is. And so they believe that at death, you're just annihilated. You're gone, never to, your soul is you're dead because your body is dead. And so that is their belief on the afterlife. There's only two things, much different than what we believe in the afterlife. So, uh, and it all goes back to the point to where they don't believe that the human soul and spirit are different. They believe the human soul and, and sp uh, the human body and the human soul are one. But I don't believe the Bible teaches us that. I believe the Bible specifically teaches us that there's two um, parts to our bodies there. So you add those to what we looked at last week, and those are our basic beliefs. And I know I haven't been uh, changing my, my slides up here, sorry. So what are their practices? What are their practices? What, what, what do they practice? So if someone asked us, what do we practice? We may say, well, we practice meeting at church. You know, we have church services. We practice baptism. We practice the Lord's Supper, some things like that. So what are some, some things that they practice that, that, that may be different from us that, that, are, that are out there? Well, most of y'all probably heard these before, but let me go through some of these these uh, with you. Uh, some of their practices. First of all, they do not celebrate birthdays, Christmas, Easter, or any holiday. 
So if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you do not celebrate your birthday, you do not celebrate Christmas, you don't celebrate Easter, you don't celebrate any holidays. I'm not going to go into the big, long, long... We spent all night on why they don't do this. But I didn't want to get into that tonight. Just know that they don't celebrate any of those. They believe it's based on the Bible. They get Bible verses based on some of these things, but they don't celebrate any holidays. They believe that Christmas and Easter holidays where we celebrate Jesus Christ, that those are pagan holidays. They were created by Satan to lead us astray and they don't believe in those. So they won't celebrate any holidays. They do not vote or hold office. They will not vote. If you're in high school, if you're having a class election, you're a Jehovah's Witness, you can't vote for anybody. You're in school, you can't vote for anybody. You're an adult, general election, whatever election, you're Jehovah's Witness, you're not supposed to vote. You cannot vote. You cannot salute the flag. You cannot be patriotic. You cannot participate in the military. You cannot have blood transfusions. This causes a lot of trouble with Jehovah's Witnesses because a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses will need blood transfusions to stay alive and they will not be able to do that. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the Bible verses. I will give you these Bible verses in your notes later <laughs> if you want them. But they, I'll show you why they say that. But here's some interesting things that I also found. And I call this what they're not allowed to do. And this is really what sets them apart from a lot of other groups is because as a Christian, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you what you're, you are and are not allowed to do. I'll show you what the Bible says you should and shouldn't do, but I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that, hey, as a member of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church or as a Southern Baptist or as a Christian, you can't do these things. I'll show you where the Bible says you shouldn't do them because it's a sin, but that's about as far as I'll go. But here are things that they are told they are not allowed to do. They are not allowed to belong to any organization or club for the purpose of socializing with non-believers. So no country club membership, no other clubs that will associate with non-believers. They can't, they can't be a part of that at all. They can't have best friends who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. They can't associate with people outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses unless it's necessary. They cannot attend social functions sponsored by their employers unless attendance is required. Association with co-workers after business hours in a social setting is forbidden. They cannot disagree with the organization's rules and code of conduct. They cannot disagree with their organization's doctrines. They cannot use a gun for any purpose. They cannot become a police officer if a gun is required. They cannot wear military uniforms or clothing associated with war. They cannot donate books. I mean, donate books. Donate blood. They cannot read books, magazines, or publications from other religions. They cannot play competitive sports on school teams. They can't play competitive sports professionally. They can't run for any office, whether it's in school or public. Uh, they can't go to the school prom or school dances. They can't go to any school activities like that. They can't do anything they're not supposed to. They cannot join the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. And uh, some even go as far as say that you're not supposed to even buy the cookies. So... Uh, I know some of y'all, that would keep you from joining right there, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, women are not allowed to wear pants at the Kingdom Hall. You're not allowed to wear or own a cross. You're not allowed to wear or own any religious picture. And I know I went through those pretty quick, but there's a whole long list of things they can and can't, I mean, that they cannot do if you're Jehovah's Witness. And once again, I can show you where I found this from their literature. I'm not making this up or getting this. I can find all of this and back all of this up from their literature that they put out there. So, why do they believe these things? Some of you are looking at me like, I would never, I wouldn't believe some of these things. You know, why would they believe these things? Well, I stand up here and I tell you this. I tell you that everything that we get is based on the Bible, right? I tell you, if I can't show you in the Bible, it's, it, then, then it's not there. So, what do they say? Well, they'll tell you the same thing. They'll say, everything we believe is in the Bible. And then they'll pull out their Bible called the New World Translation. They'll pull out their Bible called the New World Translation. And the reason I call it their Bible is because their Bible was released in 1950. So in 1950, they went through, uh, according to their documents, they, they went through the original language, the, the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic. They went through all the original language and they went in and they translated it as accurate or more accurate than anybody else had done at the time in 1950. So in 1950, the New Testament came out. Then in 1961, they brought out the rest of the Bible, so they had a complete New World Translation Bible by 1961. And then in 2013, they went back in and revised it, so they changed some of the language in it in 2013. 
And so they have their own translation. And here's what they say. They say, as a translation of the Holy Scriptures made directly from the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek into modern-day English by a committee of anointed witnesses of Jehovah. The New World Testament is the anonymous work of the New World Bible Translation Committee. Jehovah's Witnesses claim that the anonymity is in, is, is in place so that the credit of the work will go to God. So in other words, they're not going to tell us who came up with the translations because they don't want to give them credit. They want the credit to go for God. So we don't know any of their credentials. We don't know if they knew the languages. We don't know anything about who did this. And so the immediate question that we asked is, is it an accurate translation? Did they accurately translate it right? I mean, that's what we would want to know. And what I would answer that question is, is, well, what do biblical scholars say? What do the people who study the ancient languages say? And if you go and you look at the people who study the ancient languages and know these ancient languages, they will say it is not an accurate translation, is what they will say. And so I do not believe it is an accurate translation. Matter of fact, here's what one research team had to say about the translation. Now, once again, this is a Christian research team. But here's what they said about the translation. The New World Translation is unique in one thing. It is the first intentional, systematic effort at producing a complete version of the Bible that is edited and revised for the specific person of agreeing, for the purpose of agreeing with a group's doctrine. The Jehovah's Witness and the Watchtower Society realized their beliefs contradicted Scripture. So rather than conforming their beliefs to Scripture, they altered Scripture to agree with their beliefs. That's what a group of biblical scholars said about the New World Translation. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to go over some of the changes that were made in the translation. And I'm going to show you in just a second, I'm going to show you what their translation says, and then I'm going to show you what the New King James Version translation says. And the only reason I picked the New King James Version translation is because that's the one I normally use. So uh, <laughs> that's the one I normally use. But he, here's, what, here's what they did. The first thing that you'll notice is that there are nearly 7,000 uses of the word Jehovah in the Old Testament in their Bible. Why? Because they believe Jehovah is the only name for God. So anywhere in the Bible that there was another name for God listed, which really has helpful meaning for us as Christians, they went and changed that name to Jehovah. 237 times in the New Testament, they went and did the same thing. And so they really went in and changed instead of God being the Father that Jesus Christ is always calling him to be, he is called Jehovah, not the Father there. They replaced it with Jehovah. With Jehovah. So let's go to the very first verses in the Bible and let's see how they started changing it at the very beginning. On this side over here, you have the, their translation. On this side over here, you have the New King James translation. So I'm going to read the New King James first. In the beginning, this is Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, if you look in theirs, I've got it underlined where it's changed, but you'll see the change. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's good. Now the earth was formless and desolate, and there was darkness upon the surface of the watery deep, and God's active force was moving about over the surface of the waters. So do you remember last week? They don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person. They don't believe the Holy Spirit is part of God. They believe that the Holy Spirit is part of God's force going out there in the world and, and, and acting, kind of like they, they compare it to electricity. And so they changed... The translation, instead of it being the Spirit of God, because they don't believe that God is, a, is the, the Spirit is part of God, they changed it to say God's active force was moving about over the surface of the waters. Okay? So that's just, at the very beginning, you can see where they started changing. Second one, Zechariah 12.10. And I'm just showing you a few examples here. Uh, Zechariah 12.10. New King James. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. The New World Testament. 
Translation, excuse me, New World Translation. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of favor and supplication, and they will look on the one whom they pierced, and they will wail over him as they would wail over any for an only son. They will grieve bitterly over him as they would grieve over his firstborn son. Now, when you first look at this, you may say, hey, that's not that big of a change. That's not a big deal. But I want you to look at what they did. All of a sudden, Jesus Christ... In verse 10, then they will look on me whom they pierced. So God is talking. He said they will look on me whom they pierced. So he is calling Jesus Christ God is what he's doing. But then you look over here in the New World Translation, they will look to the one whom they pierced. Because they do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. They don't believe that he was anything but a perfect human. And so they had to change the translation to say, instead of God saying, look on me whom they pierced, they had to change the translation to say, look on the one whom they pierced. So that they can see that there's a difference there. And so there's a difference in there. The biggest one that I think is really the, 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 the biggest, worst one, I guess you would call it, is in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the, the New King James Version. Their version says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And notice it's a little g, because they don't believe that Jesus Christ was God, and so because... John 1.1 1, 1 was calling Jesus Christ God. He was equal to God, God in every way. They had to change it, but they, you had to really figure out how to change it because you had to keep the word was God, but how do you do it? So you had to say the word was a God, but now all of a sudden they're calling Jesus Christ a God, but he's not a powerful God like Jehovah is. And so now if you go and ask them, well, isn't that religion teaching you that there's more than one God and, and then all of a sudden you get into the multiple gods and, and it really causes trouble with their beliefs if you really look at it. But they don't believe Jesus was a God but they had to change this to fit somehow so they put the word was a God. A God. So Jesus was just a God is what we see here. There are many more. Let me go over just a couple more of these with you. John 19, 17. I don't think I put this on your notes. I'll give these to you later. But John 19, 17. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is, is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Now look at how they changed it. Being, bearing the torture stake for himself, he went out to the so-called skull place, which is called Golgotha in Hebrew. They don't believe Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross. They don't believe it was a cross. They believe it was a torture stake. Basically, one stake, one big stick in the air. His hands were above him. And that's where he was put. Torture stake is what they call it. And so they changed every place you see a cross in the Bible, they'll change it to torture stake. And some problems with that is, you know, you talks about Jesus Christ's arms being stretched. It talks about both his hands being pierced, three nails, things like that. Just complications <laughs> complications Colossians I believe that's next maybe not yeah Colossians this is verse 15 this is Colossians 1 15 we're going to read 15 through 17 and then we'll probably call it a night he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation their translation says he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation Okay, and here's why. They, don't believe, they believe Jesus Christ was created. They believe that God created him first, and then God created all the other angels, and so Jesus and Lucifer, Satan, are brothers, basically, because he created. And the way they change it here, the firstborn of all creation instead of the firstborn over all creation, because if you look in our version here, go to verse 16. For by him all things were created, by Jesus Christ all things were created. They say by means of him all other things were created in the heavens and the earth. And then at the bottom they talk about all other things have been created through him because he was the firstborn. So he, and, and so they try to make, they put the word other in here like four times to try to make it look like that Jesus was not uh, God. Jesus is described as being the creator of all things in the original word, but they don't believe that, so they said that he was the creator of other things, that God used him to help create other things, is what they said. And then I do want to read Titus to you really quick. 
Look at Titus 2.13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the New King James Version. Their version says, While we wait for the happy hope and glorious manifestation of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Notice, they call great, they called him God and Savior Jesus Christ. Translation, what does that make Jesus? That makes him God. So he's great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's both. Over here, you have the great God, separate, Jehovah, and you have the Savior, Jesus Christ. So they two separate people because Jesus is not God, according to their translation. And so they really work to change Jesus Christ from being God in all their translations, is what they do. And so uh, that is why whenever they go and say, well, our Bible says this, the Bible says this, and they open up their Bible, you can see these ver certain verses here where their Bible will change the wording to match what they believe. Now, here's the good news. Some of their translate, some of their Verses they left in there. And so you can go read John 3, 16 and theirs and ours and it's going to read exactly the same. And it kind of tricks me about how they can do that. But if you do, it reads exactly the same. So that's a good verse to go in theirs and look at too. But so how do we defend ourselves? We're out of time tonight. But how do we defend ourselves? Well, what we do is we defend ourselves with the Bible. And the first question you're going to ask is, well, if we defend ourselves with the Bible, aren't they just going to go to their Bible and they'll say, well, our Bibles are just different and ours is right. Well, let, let me tell you this before we, before we close for tonight and then we'll get into this biblical defense next week. And then we'll start, we probably start with the Mormons after we look at this biblical defense next week. But the Bible tells us that it can defend itself. What does that mean? That means that you and I don't have to sit there and defend the Bible. That means that you and I don't have to sit there and if it's God's true word, it's going to defend itself. So what we must do is as we go through here and we read these verses and we see why we must let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts and our lives, let us believe these things first, but then we must invite them to, to test it themselves. And what that does is that they test it themselves. That is then all of a sudden God starting to come in and show them the truth of the word. And so we have to be careful as we do this and, and not take this attitude of, well, your Bible is completely wrong. Your Bible is, is, is trash. We can't take that attitude. What we have to do is we have to invite them to say, hey, let me show you what we believe, why we believe it based on what our Bible says, and then let the Holy Spirit go through. So what we'll do next week is we'll go through the rest of the note sheet of biblical defense. I pretty much gave you everything you need there, but biblical defense. And then we'll look at five or six tips or helpers on talking to someone that's Jehovah's Witness. How do you do that? Because I learned a few things as I was doing this about what you shouldn't do because uh, there are certain things that if you say certain words or you say it a certain way or you ask them certain questions, you're really going to offend them. And the last thing we want to do is offend them. I know sometimes we want to go in guns blazing. But as we'll see next week, that's not the best way to do it. And so next week we'll look at what the Bible has to say about what they believe versus what we believe and then we'll look at some tips on talking and witnessing to them. So any questions on the New World, or the, uh, the New World Translation, their beliefs on salvation, or the afterlife, or any of their practices? Any questions or comments on that tonight before we close this and go into prayer requests? Yes. They, they don't, yeah, they don't believe in hell because they don't believe that God, a loving God, would punish people, basically. Is that kind of what, that, that God would send people to hell because he's a loving God? Okay. Is that... When I try to study with her because I want to see what the difference was or whatever. Um, she didn't have revelations in her Bible. Oh, there was no revelation. I didn't see that because the one that I saw had revelation in that Bible. That's interesting that you, have, you were talking to someone that is a Jehovah who is, didn't have revelation in there. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, but the one that I, I saw had revelation in it. Um, but but I, that's a good question because I, I, let's go back to the, you know, a loving God would not send people to hell. That, that's a really good question. So, so here's my take on that. God is a God of love, 
but God also is a holy and righteous God. And because God is holy and righteous, he has to carry out punishment for those who disobey. And, and so if God wasn't a holy and righteous person, a holy and righteous God and perfect in every way, then he could just say, oh, there's no punishment for anybody. But because he's holy and righteous and justified, there has to be a punishment for those who, who don't. And the other thing is this, and I'll adamantly say this, is God has never sent anyone to hell. We do that on our own. God has never sent anyone to hell. He sent Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and if we decide to reject Jesus Christ, then we've done that on our own. God is not the one that is sending people to hell. We are doing it on our own because we're rejecting Jesus Christ is what we're doing. And so, number one, there has to be some kind of punishment there because God is a holy and righteous God. It's like a, a judge sitting there on his uh, judgment seat and the law says, because the law says if you do this, you have to have this punishment. And, and the judge gets up there and says, oh, I'm not going to punish anybody. Well, the, the judge is not a, a righteous, holy judge. And so because God is a holy, righteous judge and the law says this is the punishment, it has to be carried out. But then the second part of that, as I said, is, you know, God isn't sending anybody there. It is our choice. It is people, and, and I see it and I hear it. People say, I don't want God. I don't need God. God can do whatever he wants to with me. And then at the end of the time, guess what he does? He gives them their wish when they die. And, and I think that's the sad part about it is it's people rejecting Christ more. That's a really good question uh, there. But I hadn't heard the Revelation thing about not having Revelation in the Bible because Revelation really describes hell. But so does Matthew and Luke. So. But they believe that when hell is mentioned in the Bible, that it's just talking about the grave. Just literally you're going to the grave because there's no, no, no existence left in you. That's a good question. Any others? I may not be able to answer them, but if y'all got any, let me know. How they baptize? I don't know that one. I have to look that up because I don't know. I don't know if there's, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's complete submersion, but I don't know. I will look that up for next week though. Yeah, if you don't work hard enough, you will be no more. But she believed that the 144,000 were already there. Yeah, because they didn't change that until what did I say, 2007? No, no Two, yeah, yeah, no chance. Yeah, but they, they revised that. I can't remember what year I said, but they revised that in like 2007 or something. They revised that. So now there's still a chance for people today to be in the 144,000, possibly, if you work hard enough. That's sad. But I don't know how they baptize. So I'll look that up and I'll, give you, I'll, I'll bring that back in next, next Wednesday. Any others? Good questions. All right, let's close in prayer and then we'll go over some announcements in uh, our, our prayer list. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for giving us your word. And Father, I pray for wisdom. Lord, I pray for discernment that as you promised us that, Lord, if we ask for wisdom, you give it to us. Lord, help us have wisdom as we read your word to understand the truth in your word and to understand that as we go through your word, it always leads us back to you, back to Jesus Christ, and back to the truth. So help us have that. Father, help us to, to have a ready uh, knowledge of the Bible, Lord, so that we can uh, be firm in our own faith, Lord, as we go about our lives. And just help us to always be a loving witness to those around us, Lord, no matter uh, if they know you or not, Lord, just always let us be that loving witness in the things that we say and that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.